So very good afternoon to everybody who's joining us here for the Power Talks. Uh, today we have with us, um, you know, Kevin Bharati Mittal, who has got, as I feel as an editor, he's got many firsts to his credit. I mean, uh, one, of course, instead of joining the family business of Airtel, he decided to find his own startup and hike at that, um, you know, crack the code of also becoming one of the fastest unicorns in India. So, um, you know, um, it's always good to see and talk to a unicorn entrepreneur who's actually been able to uh, go out there and prove his mettle. Uh, but, you know, also as an editor, whenever I talk to a unicorn, I also see and see how not just it's not about the life and the risks that they take, but it's also the fact that they're always in um, the forefront. So whatever actions they take and in the organizations are minor mistakes, major mistakes, horrifying actions, all of them come to the core and are talked about and evaluated and detailed in the media by editors like us. But, you know, that's that's the way life works. Um, so today, um, you know, he's also going to talk to us. So welcome, uh, Kevin. And um, he's actually doing another first, which is what we're really going to talk about today, is that how today virtual reality and social networking are going to mix with each other as we go forward. So the future of social looks vastly different than what we have known it to be in the last few years. So welcome again, Kevin. And uh, let me start with one question, which I'm sure you get asked a lot. But something we would love to know from you is that as a unicorn entrepreneur, you know, life is hard. It's a lonely journey. You know, there's as many unicorns in this world, really, uh, as there can be. So what is life like over there? And I'm sure, who do you go for guidance? It's, I, I always feel that who do unicorns go for? I'm sure everybody they want to talk to want to bite their horn off uh, their head as a unicorn <laughs> instead of really helping them and giving them real advice as to what uh, could be possibly they do. So, you know, let's start with that. Let's understand, you know, how life has been and how is it that you continue to innovate in uh, circumstances which I feel are most trying for unicorns most of the time? Sure, sure. Ritu, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you uh, and, and talk more. Uh, you know, it's a great question. And uh, I feel like, um, you know, the, the world has evolved so much in the last couple of decades that I think the approach, at least for the, the younger entrepreneurs, um, and, you know, I've seen this with many of uh, some, some, you know, uh, equals that I have in, in around the world who are building companies that are even bigger than sort of what Hike is, is that we live in the world of the internet and you know and people they undervalue the power of the internet and the internet has effectively made information transfer free <laughs> so there's all this information sitting online in terms of research papers books text videos now because the network has become so good and all the information you want is sitting out there the question is do you have the desire and the clarity to find that information. Hmm. I think that's one. Um, and uh, because, you know, and there's so many people who build such great companies and, and systems and frameworks that actually have put everything online. And not only do you get to consume this information, but you get a chance to, you know, randomly ping them, in interact with them if you want to, and sometimes they respond. Yeah. And so the boundaries have completely been knocked down, even, of course, inside India too. So I think that's one. And second is, you know, I'm a, I'm a first principle thinker. I feel like everything needs to have frameworks. Uh, and people, uh, you know, look at the world through their perspective. So it's very, very important to have a, a perspective that works for the problem that they, they are trying to solve. And to build a company, you know, it's, uh, it's actually not that hard. <laughs> you know, we initially thought that uh, building a company is, is, uh, is a complicated uh, matter. It's not complicated. It's tough. It's not easy, but it's actually... It, it, it's difficult in terms of, you know, putting the effort in, but it's not complicated. And, uh, you know, I have a, a five point sort of framework that I used to build hike, which is vision principles, people, product process, which is, do you have a big vision, a, a future that you're sort of chasing after a, the way the world would look like in a couple of years from now? Uh, do you have a set of principles that you're using to sort of go chase after that vision? And using those principles, are you hiring people? And those principles are very, very important. Um, those, those are your, your cultural code usually. Can you hire people who align to your values and principles? And with those people, can you build some fantastic products for the customers? 
And can you add just a little bit of process to streamline all of the work? And so, you know, that, that framework we, I developed about two, three, four years ago, and it served us extremely well. And each piece, by the way, is evolving. The vision is evolving. The principles are evolving. The people are, you know, and that's just, uh, that's just a fact of life. Um, so, you know, that's how we, we think about sort of uh, building a company. And I go back to the point, which is um, just fortunate to live in a world where access to all of this stuff is just free. <laughs> And yes. that's made life so much easier. Yes, I truly agree. And now, I mean, uh, we're really in the middle of a digital uh, sort of bonanza. And I mean, anybody who's actually building a digital business, I mean, the timing could not be more perfect. I mean, you know, everybody is digital today. So therefore, um, it's just about your perseverance and going out there and finding your customers. But eventually, everything is digital. So, I mean, going forward, you know, um, what would love to know what has changed for you at Hike. I mean, I know there is a, you've launched Hike Land, which is a, a social networking platform. And what is it uh, that you are trying uh, to achieve through Hike Land? What is it that you saw was an opportunity? I know that we talked about digital and digital being a great opportunity. But what is the pie that you are trying to capture out of the digital um, movement or revolution, which is now sort of become more mainstream today? And uh, what do you think the opportunity is? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the world has changed so much in the last two, three years. And this is also just before COVID happened. You know, we've got so much new technology. 4G has become prevalent in the country. It's really cheap. It's practically unlimited. Smartphones have become very good. So people have like, you know, access to some amazing technology in their hands. And um, with all this technology, um, you can finally do things you couldn't do before. You can build user experiences you couldn't build even a couple of years ago. And with COVID, I think the adoption of spending more time online has, um, has risen tremendously because spending time in lockdown at home means spending time online. And it's had a big impact on, on how, how people are interacting with their friends and family because people are social creatures at the end of the day and they yearn for social connection. And so people are looking for all these places to hang out online, which is benefiting us tremendously too in terms of uh, sort of traffic. And so the big question we asked was, you know, a year or two ago, with all this new technology that we have, um, you know, why do social products still look the same as they did 10 years ago? Uh, if you look at messaging products are built for the 2G world, it's still a chat list. You know, you still have the feed, that was built for the PC. The world has moved on. So why have social products not gotten up? And the one interesting data point that we have always um, uh, cited with Hike has been that our, our peak usage has been from 10 to 12.30 at night. And so that got us very curious and we started talking to our users and we realized that it's not that people are messaging one another. They're trying to hang out inside a hike online because they can't hang out offline. And so we said, okay, wow. So why are people hanging out in a messaging app, in a messaging experience? Surely we can build something much, much better. And so that is the, the goal of Hike Land, which is, can we build a, a brand new magical and safe place to hang out online? Uh, that goes beyond the traditional experiences of messaging, that goes beyond the traditional experiences of the feed, that goes beyond the arbitrary parameters of success, likes, comments, that focuses purely on building great relationships. Hmm. Can you build a social product that is truly social? Hmm. And, um, and technologies come ahead so much that we really believe the user experience to go make that happen is what we call a virtual world is no longer these tabs in a list that say, can you bring the sentience of the real world online into a virtual world? In a virtual world where you have a virtual you, where you can be the best version of you you wanna be. And that's what we're building on Hike Land. And you know, it started off with the Hike Moji about nine months back, which is you take a photo of yourself and using machine learning, we bring you into the you know, virtual world and you can deck yourself out and it's doing phenomenally well. People are absolutely loving it. And now the big question was, what more can your Hike Moji do? And so this virtual world, we have your home where you can actually invite someone to your home and hang out with them and watch things together. There's a big screen where you know we sort of gather people around the, the content and media they love. 
and uh, we're literally building the world's first mobile first virtual world and it's exciting today because um, you know i think through covid we've sort of seen what would have happened in two three years happen in these two three months the world has been forced to adapt and spend more time online and figure out these things we wouldn't have figured out <laughs> had it not been for for the last couple of months and so we're excited. The, the, the we launched Hikinet about two, three weeks back. The feedback is overwhelmingly positive. We're actually quite uh, pleasantly surprised because it's such an early preview. Uh, but that's what we're building and we're super excited. Um, yeah, I mean, we're looking forward to it. And, you know, the first time we talked about it, I actually said that you're building a Roblox of, uh, for adults, you know, which is like <laughs> actually putting a digital avatar out there. But, you know, interestingly, when I spoke to you about maybe a month back, it was the first time I was hearing something like this, but today I found, yesterday I found Facebook doing something similar with digital avatars and, you know, wanting to explore more. We've already, I've already met one very young uh, event startup who's doing the same thing with uh, trying to bring virtual events through digital avatars. In education, we're already seeing schools working uh, on that area. So, I mean, you know, the whole scope of um, uh, trying to sort of build virtual reality uh, online is becoming and extending itself into a lot of areas. So what particular areas in the social space you feel are going to be very interesting or areas to watch for? And I mean, are you allowing other developers or outside developers to actually come and build newer um, I would say, uh, virtual reality, uh, you know, hangouts within uh, Hikeland. Yeah, you know, you're right. The, the virtual world means sky is the limit. You know, where do you start and where do you stop? And so for us, Hike has always been a, a place of close friends. And we really believe today's social media platforms don't really put the relationships at the center. They put the user at the center and make the user a product and with the aim of extracting as much data from the customer as possible so they can build, you know, their ad sort of business model. And we want to flip that on the head and say, you know, let's go back to having a beginner's mind and thinking from scratch about what it means to build a fantastic social platform that really values relationships. And so we have a North Star, which is great relationships make happy people. And what can we do through our virtual world to further that mission statement? And relationships come, at least the way we are categorized in two forms, existing relationships, people you already know. So can we give them more avenues to hang out online because they can't hang out offline? And just like in the real world, you tend to bump into other people. You build new friends, build new relationships. Can we enable that in the online world too? Because people are very comfortable online these days. And so maybe new relationships could form on the platform as well to start with around the idea of a big screen, which is the content you love. And these are the, the first two experiences out of 10, 15 experiences we're launching on the platform. And, um, you know, our, our target audience also is young. It's sort of between 16, 17, and 21, 22, high school, sort of college. So we focus on that segment. And um, yes, the dream is, of course, to build this into a platform one day. You know, you know we have the metaphor of islands so the home is an island in in, in high clan the, the big screen is an island why can't we let other people build islands in high clan over time and so yes absolutely i think um, you'll see us start talking more about sort of building high clan to a platform sometime in 2021 but in 2020 the idea is to release it get the early preview out get the feedback on whether people are understanding what we're building they understand the user experience because it's brand new no one's seen anything like this before sure Second of all, try our early hand business model, because we really believe that the future of social, social products will not be ad driven. The business models will not be ad driven. There'll be a virtual economy, micro transactions, and we wanna, in 2020, prove our hand at some of the stuff as well. And once we've proven that the user experience works and people are loving that, and that there's potential to build a virtual economy, building a platform becomes even easier because other developers also understand that this is a platform that's working, and they can monetize as well. And that's the path we'll take in the next sort of uh, 12 months. Sure. You just mentioned about monetization. I mean, I know that, you know, for a lot of startups, finding monetizing opportunities have always been tough and, you know, uh, trying to actually get customers to pay for services they expect they are going to get free of cost uh, becomes a challenge by itself. So where do you feel um, you know, monetization opportunities lies at such platform, uh, which is about social hangouts. I mean, you know, uh, where, where, where do you think uh, people would want to pay in order to have these experiences? You know, um, 
you're right. I think it's it's always a tricky question. But like I said, we really believe the future of social is, you know, vertical communities with a business model built around the idea of microtransactions and payments. And you're right. What could these microtransactions be? And uh, for us, the way we describe it, uh, you know, uh, you spend a lot of money in the real world. And if you look at your monthly statement, you'll realize 50% of what you spend money on is not what you need. <laughs> it's what makes you feel good. Human beings spend a lot of money in time and effort trying to make ourselves feel good. And if you're not spending seven, eight, nine hours in the online world of your waking life, some part of that money will shift to make your online self really good. And we've seen this happen in multiple parts of the world because payments have finally become seamless. Something, by the way, that's been, you know, China's had this for 20 years. Mm. Payments have been seamless there from a very, very early point in time. Right. But we're finally seeing that emerge in the U.S. because payments have become seamless because of mobile and the app stores. And of course, in India, in the last couple of years, through UPI and all the innovation that's happened, payments have become very seamless too. So people will spend online to make themselves feel good. And that can be, you know, chasing after new experiences. That can be improving the way your avatar looks. Uh, it can be anything really that makes you feel good. And in, in, our, in our realm of the great relationships make happy people, the, the gamut is so wide. And so um, we're excited by the fact that we get to pioneer this business model uh, in this market in 2020. And uh, while there may be equivalents you know, sitting in small places around the world that we may take some inspiration from. Uh, it's for us to figure it out as we move forward. And, you know, we've talked about this multiple times, which is we really believe for a big space business like ours, which is a digital business, we have no, you know, warehousing, no logistics and so on and so forth. Our value is just in the pixels. And so revenue for us also is one more pixel. It's a feature. And so the way we experiment with uh, building features, we also experiment in the ways we make revenue. Yeah. And so 2020 is all about what experiments can be run around revenue inside the product. And you will see us announce something in the next couple of months. Hopefully. Sure. And I mean, you also acquired Winzo, uh, I think last year. And when, so do you feel that gaming could be a big opportunity where people would come hang out and play games together? I mean, we've already seen that happening across other platforms where people are playing games with friends and, uh, you know, family and all of that. So do you feel that could be a big opportunity uh, to explore? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we invested in Windsor. We're the, the biggest shareholder in Windsor after the founders. Uh, that's doing incredibly well. It's grown 20x in 12 months. Um, and gaming is a, you know, gaming has always been an important part of our, our overall strategy and gaming we see as a new form of bite-sized entertainment for the masses. And the difference between, let's say, a content app and a gaming app is that people actually pay for gaming. Hmm. You don't, you won't necessarily pay to watch a TikTok video, right. but you will pay to play a game. And so we believe it's a fantastic new way of entertainment bite size, it's also, the business model also is very, very strong. And so we're big believers in gaming. And, uh, you know, we've been, we, we, we stay in touch with the Winzo team all the time. And, you know, we're sort of uh, asking them to double down on the traction that they have. And yes, you'll see the same uh, insights sort of put into Highland as well. You know, if, if great relationships have to be formed, you know, they're formed around shared experiences. And uh, gaming is a fantastic shared experience that can diffuse uh, the tension. And if you look at you know, some of the other applica applications online that are trying to build relationships, it's a very direct way of making relationships happen. Yes. We actually believe the opposite. We really believe that if you have something in the middle around which people can hang out, it makes things a lot easier. Whether that's your content in the big screen, over time, whether that's gaming in, inside Highland. So we're, we're, we're definitely big on gaming and, and expect to see some kind of gaming inside Highland very soon. That, that's good to know. And I mean, gaming itself is on the rise. So that could be a, certainly a big opportunity to capture. And then when you have people at the platform and games to be played, um, I can only get begin to imagine what is really coming up and it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, let me talk uh, on another side of the business, which is raising capital. 
So today uh, we find that you know with uh, China India face off coming getting Chinese capital and Chinese capital has been driving a lot of unicorns in India a lot of in fact one of your uh, venture uh, fund is a Chinese fund. So do you think money is going to be tighter for a lot of funds going forward? Uh, do you feel that you know there's going to be more pressure to raise capital and therefore be able to make the most of the capital? In fact you know the sweat of the capital might now be more controlled by the venture capitalists than it was done formerly the burn the outcome of that burn and so on. So what, what parameters do you see emerging when it comes to raising capital and using capital? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's clear that the all things China apps and Chinese capital, of course, are you know, a big no-no going forward. Um, we do have a partnership with Tencent. Um, we value their uh, partnership, but Tencent is a very sort of minority investor in the company. And significantly minority to a point where you know it doesn't it's like a financial investment so no say in the business however there are companies inside the country big unicorns that have significant chinese shareholding yes and i'm sure they're wondering what to do in, in light of what's happening um no doubt uh, access the capital from china which has been one of the biggest sources by far in india has now been put on pause or at least it's become very difficult for that capital to come in and so I think entrepreneurs have to look for other sources of capital, but you know, um, they exist and not just inside of India, but around the globe. Uh, if you look at, you know, SoftBank, if you look at, uh, you know, people like Tiger that we raised from in our series C back in 2014, um, there are enough and more people uh, around the world beyond China that actually have a uh, massive capital waiting to be deployed in nascent markets like India behind fantastic entrepreneurs. Right. And I'm of the opinion that, you know, the best entrepreneurs see fundraising as a problem to be solved. Hmm. It's one more problem to be solved. And of course, the variables of the problem are very different. But if you're a good problem solver, you figure it out. Yeah. And, and uh, if you're clear about the business you're building, if your customers love you, your metrics are fantastic, and you have signs of people paying you, I mean, your life becomes a lot easier. And there's enough capital in the world chasing great companies and entrepreneurs. Yeah. And so I think that's the, and you know, and, and even during times like COVID, of course, it's, it's difficult for some companies to, 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 to sort of sustain and sort of move forward. Um, it's quite the opposite for digital businesses. You know, we, we've seen a wave of absurd in usage. So actually it's, it's been a, a strangely fan, in a fantastic time for digital businesses that are pixels only because people are spending more time locked out in homes and thus spending more time online hanging out with people. And so, um, you know, I think from that perspective, you know, uh, capital raising should not be a problem. And there's plenty of capital in the world. As a matter of fact, I'm just thinking, until the last three, four years, most of the capital that came into India was non-Chinese. Mm, correct. It's only the last three, four years when, you know, China really started pushing the pedal. So there's more, more than enough capital. And I think the best entrepreneurs will have the best products and the best companies and the best investors will want to have access to the best entrepreneurs. I think uh, it'll work itself out. Sure. And yeah, I mean, that, that's what we wish for, right? And I mean, you know, uh, what you just said uh, in terms of uh, the Chinese capital may not be available, but we are in digital times right now. So do you think particularly for Indian apps, this may be a very good time? Because, you know, obviously we're not uh, for and we're banning a lot of Chinese apps which have been able to make their headway in the country very quickly. In fact, TikTok is not there in China at all. It's only there in India, uh, primarily putting on was, in fact. Uh, it's not there anymore, then you cannot onboard TikTok. So do you think it could be a good time for a lot of make in India apps? And therefore, I think a lot of uh, young startups should actually be uh, putting their minds in terms of building new apps and or even partnering with apps like yours to see if they could build another area or a, a foreground into within Highland itself. So yeah, you think a lot of startups are likely to marry each other within India uh, to create or build on this opportunity. I think uh, everybody is definitely thinking about it. You know, how do you opt opportunistic and go after the opportunity that's been left, um, you know, by, uh, by um, the, the lack of China apps being there. And they're not just, it's not just TikTok, by the way. There's 59 apps. There is UC Browser, there is Share It, there is Hago, there is a bunch of apps across all spectrums. Yeah. That actually, have, by the way, have a l massive user base. The Chinese apps combined, I think, have three, 400 million users. 
And now that they've gone, you know, that opportunity completely opens up and you can see that the top apps in the Play Store right now are the sort of so-called TikTok equivalents, share chat, reposal, and so on and so forth. The big question is, I think first of all, how long does the ban last? Is it truly, you know, a serious long-term ban or is it just three, four months? And so I think that's going to be a big question. Um, if the ban, you know, lasts, and this is for here to stay, it's a fantastic thing for Indian apps because finally you have one part of the world that's cut off from access to the market. And you know, as a as a as a entrepreneur building for this market, you know, our competition has always been global, and I can tell you, it's a it's a very difficult thing. And um, so we welcome this move. We welcome the whole you know Atmanirbhar Bharat initiative across the board, especially to do with apps. Because we, I think India needs to build its own ecosystem of companies. China's internet economy with itself is three trillion dollars. Sure. That's bigger than India's entire economy. <laughs> and you know, a large portion of that is not just the innovation they did in the market, but just closing off access for some time so they can build their champions in the market that are now inventing for the globe. And it's great to see the government realize that it's time for us to go do this, not across just the app internet space, but across many industries. We're talking about agriculture, you know, pharma, manufacturing. Um, and you know, the smartphone industry is the one that, by the way, is a great example. It's a great case study. I think 50% plus market share is with Chinese smartphones. And when you have a home market where you can become very successful, then it's very easy to oversupply a foreign market, drop prices, and destroy the local ecosystem. Where is Micromax? Where is Lava? Where is Kava? They're all gone. Yeah, sure. And so it's important to ensure that there's not unfair, a, a unfair sort of playing field for the market. And I think that for the Indian app developer, just coming back to that point in the midst of all of this, I think it's it's a fantastic opportunity. But you also have to be building fantastic products and solving a real customer pain point. And I think that comes first. And if you do that, these waves become bonus for you. They become tailwinds right. behind you. And uh, we've seen that with, with a couple of applications that are building for the market. And, you know, uh, mid to long term, the best products win because it's not about downloads and acquisitions. It's about retention. It's about when people download the app, do they stay and continue to use the product, you know, 12 months from now. And I think uh, a lot of people, uh, I think the best products that are getting that sort of table when actually focusing on that in a big way. And coming back to sort of new people sort of starting up, I think, you know, this China app ban has given a, a massive tailwind to maybe the sectors in which people could build apps. You know, people were thinking, oh my God, content, why should we build in the content space? Is buy down to the billion dollars. You know, that has been completely blocked off. Yeah. And so that, that big competitive gorilla in the space is gone and suddenly the space is wide open. So maybe entrepreneurs can start thinking about what sort of things to build in, in, in content. And same thing with the other app categories that have been banned. But just remember, it's just China that's been banned, not the world. <laughs> that's true and so you still have the Facebooks and the Googles and all these guys who by the way are in all the spaces the Chinese apps are in and have products that are bigger by the way than the Chinese companies yes so one, one should not forget that okay so you know now we've got a lot of questions pouring in so we've got um, so let me start by asking one we've received on FB live which is that by Ravi Verma who says that did you build the app yourself or you had a business idea and came up with the framework and drove it forward? As in, did I code the app myself? Um, I think what <laughs> he's essentially trying to ask is that, did it start from the idea stage or was it something that you, uh, so did you code? Yeah, probably that. Did you code it yourself or did you have a team to do it? <laughs> no, so, you know, the, we built a person of four or five, we built a team of four or five people. It's a very small team. Um, you know, I designed the first version of Hike. Uh, I didn't code it up because I'm awful at coding. <laughs> and so I, I hired a, a couple of very strong engineering uh, leaders to help me to go do that. Um, and, um, you know, the vision, like I said, vision principles, people, product process. You know, a founder and CEO is only as good as your team. And so you have to build a very strong team even early on, uh, you know, to, to build a product. And fortunately for anyone build, building in the digital space, you don't need many people. You don't need much capital. If you have an idea, it's just, you can start building. One person can design, one person can code. There's so much infrastructure available today that we didn't have it through back in 2012. My God, we didn't have like AWS back then, fully operational. And so it's not, it doesn't cost a lot to build an idea in the digital world. You can actually have two, three people. They can just spin up an idea and start working. And the cost is like literally zero. 
And these cloud companies give enough grants, by the way, to get you started. So you don't even need funding to start. Um, so if you have an idea, this is the, the best time to build something new. Sure. And I mean, with Highland also, I mean, did you have a, uh, the coding team in India or did you primarily have the coding team spread across the world where coders were working on the product? Uh, no, we, our culture is very different. Our culture is uh, a very creative setup. So we have a team of uh, 155 people that actually work. Of course, now everybody's remote, but we were working out of uh, Aero City, our office. And that's the team that's built Highland. So it's a purely India-driven effort with an Indian team, Indian engineers, Indian designers, um, ground up. Sure. Okay, so let me start taking some questions. So we've got a question coming from Ashlesh. Is he, uh, is Ashlesh, uh, please unmute Ashlesh before you ask the question. Please unmute. Hello. Go on, please. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, please go on. The volume is very low. Ashish, can you be louder? Hello. No, it's not coming. I can I can see his questions in the question list. Do you want me to just? Uh, yes, I think that would be a better idea. We can maybe just take his question. So what what do you think are the new trends which are emerging on social media platform? But I think you've really answered that quite a bit yourself yeah. Yeah. in terms of. Uh, um, but, you know, somebody I also see as an add-on has asked the question that do you, have you seen um, pre-COVID and post-COVID with on high platform, what changes have you observed? Well, we observed a pretty significant jump in traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to be holding um, as we speak and actually increasing as we, as, we, as we talk. And like I said, you know, people are finding new ways to hang out online and, and hike has been a place that many people have chosen to come to. So we're seeing a pretty big spike in performance that's sustaining as we speak right now. Sure. Sarthi is next. Uh, Sarthi, can you please come online and uh, unmute and ask your question? Please unmute. Okay, his question is that would you like to invest in an up and coming startup which is at an ideation stage? Um, I mean, yeah, it's a pitch, <laughs> but would you like to talk about it? Send me a pitch at uh, coven and hike.in and my team will definitely have a look at it. Okay. So we've got a lot of pitches coming for you, Kevin. I mean, there is somebody else who's also sort of said that they, it's a founder of a social media app, Outbuds. And, um, okay. I mean, uh, so my vision is to help people socialize all over the world. So how do you plan that COVID time according to you. Uh, but I think you've answered most of that really. Yeah, I think tough to build something to the real world today. It doesn't mean things will not get back to normal, but if you have a pitch, send it over. I'm excited to hear about new ideas from uh, the perspective of social apps. Yeah, so there is uh, Kiran also who's asked that, you know, is there an opportunity to actually monetize the, the team space in India from a social perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that the, the wallet size for um, the TG is definitely, relatively speaking, smaller. But the way we look at this, and this is a really good question. If you don't mind, I'm just going to read out the question. Um, you know, I have a question regarding monetizing Indian teams. What kind of wallet size do they have? I understand games like Dream 11 have been monetizing, but it's because anticipation of money. A virtual economy is a new experience and how will the slowdown of the economy impact monetization? That's a great question. So um, fortunately for us to build a fantastic business, you know, um, we just, we think if you got to a place where there are 10 million people paying you a dollar a month, you know, that's amazing. And that's not unimaginable. If you look at the Indian market, it's about half a billion internet users that are online. 10% of that is 50 million percent of that is 5 million, 2% of that is 7 million. So can we get 2% of the market to, you know, potentially pay us a dollar a month, which is about 60, 70 rupees? We think that's not unimaginable. And even for a teen audience that 
probably has a pocket money of you know six, seven, eight, ten times that. It is our job and responsibility to build a fantastic product and experiences online, where that seventy rupees could shift from something offline to something online. But people definitely have the propensity to pay those microtransactions, and the technology has become seamless enough so that microtransactions have become very easy to conduct in the online world. And of course, you have to have a fantastic product that people are sort of paying for as well. Um, there's another question which says, are you planning to introduce advertising in Hike? Uh, no, absolutely not. We are, um, we are very anti-ads in their traditional form in the way current social media platforms have put ads in. So um, in the current form, no, absolutely not. Sure. There's a question by Ritesh which says that, do you think um, uh, with dating becoming an online thing, real world, it's going to collapse? <laughs> that, that's a good one. You know, um, I don't think the real world will ever collapse because people, you know, people, human beings are human beings. We, you know, we, we, we want social connection. And I can tell you that as a company as well, we've been working remotely for the last three months. Highly productive, by the way. I mean, it was impressive. We learned so much about ourselves. But we just had a couple of meetings in person. We we're doing some planning. And it was so nice to see the team in person. And it's a whole different feel. So I feel like that's not going to go away. Um, things may become a little different. But I think once COVID sort of settles down and this wave goes away, uh, life will get back to normal. But yes, um, you know, in the meantime, you got to think about this very differently. Meeting new people is, is very different now. Can you sort of, and that's one of the core tenets of High Clan, which is can you build experiences around which people can hang out and meet like-minded people. So I'd say actually presents a massive opportunity to build fantastic products. So if you have ideas in that space, again, drop me a, a line at Covenant High Clan. So do you actually feel that Highline may actually become a platform um, for like a pre-dating, um, you know, hangout before people actually go out and uh, date in the real world? Possibly. Possibly. As a matter of fact, we, by the way, the early feedback is so strong. We have people connecting with people inside the big screen. And it's not just about, you know, uh, males connecting with females. It's people of the same gender finding like-minded people of the same gender. And you know, India has a, in, in India, the country is so big and people forget that uh, India predominantly is still pretty conservative. Social norms are still catching up. Uh, the infrastructure also in the offline world is not the same as the metros in tier one. It's still building up. And so the avenues to hang out offline are not there for everybody. And also if they are there, then the social norms are still catching up and thus people can't express themselves freely. So thus people are looking for places to hang out and meet people online. I think that's a you know massive opportunity that we believe exists in a market like India today. Sure. So there's there's actually a good question that has come up that, you know, I mean, and I was going to ask you at some point myself that what have you learned? It's come from Abhishek Jain that what are the success factors for a startup today? And, you know, what have you learned in your journey of building a unicorn? Uh, you know, how can you sort of shorten the distance to become a unicorn and at the same time sort of avoid uh, a lot of errors as you go forward? Or do you think it's just part of it? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that first and foremost, um, you know, forget, for any entrepreneur listening, forget this word unicorn, right? Forget valuation. I think the private market is very valuation obsessed, and not really fundamentally obsessed. And there's a lot of companies out there that are not fundamentally very strong, <laughs> but has skyrocket valuation. Then if you look at the public markets, you know, the stock goes up, stock goes down, no one cares, but it's all about the fundamentals of the business. And so care about building a fantastic product and care about building a fantastic business. And all you have to do is every step of the way, ensure that you're increasing the probability of success of the business. So how do you keep every step of the way, keep increasing the probability of success of your business because probabilities is something that's in your control. And there's sort of this like eight point checklist that we built over time that if you answered well, if you check them out really well, you know you're already pointing in the right direction. You know, um, first is what's the idea? Are you riding on an existing behavior? I see many companies, many founders trying to create new behaviors that don't exist. That's almost impossible to do. So are you riding on existing behavior? Are you taking the behavior that exists offline and bringing it online and making it 10 times better? Second is, is that behavior big? Is the market big? Is it a big problem to solve? Third is, do you have a unique perspective 
or a unique approach to solve for that market? Is it novel enough not to compete? You have to try your best not to compete. We really believe competition is for losers. Number four is simplicity. Can your idea in its simplest form have an impact? And because you want to get things out the door as fast as possible to launch and get feedback. So could your idea in the simplest form have an impact? Fifth is, can you find like a, a, a niche of people that absolutely love it? Because all products start off with the first hundred people, the first thousand people, the first 10,000 people that absolutely love it. And if you don't have those people, you're not going to grow. So you don't have to chase after the 10 million. You have to chase after the first hundred, thousand, 10,000. That's exactly what we don't like land. You need to chase after the first niche that absolutely love it. Sixth is, can it be automatically word of mouthy? Will it spread itself and get viral? Do you have the right team to move fast nitrate? Uh, do you have the right team to build the right product? For example, as Hike, we're a bit space business. So we can build like products in, in the digital world very, very fast. But if you ask us to build a food delivery set of setup, we're not going to be able to go do that and vice versa. And so the DNA of the company and the team that you build is also very, very important, must be suited to the problem that you're solving. And number eight is, do you like the business model? And is the business model disruptive? Because at the end of the day, it's not that technology is disruptive. Technology enables new business models to enable it. Business models are very, very disruptive. And if you're feeling confident about these eight points, the probability of success of your business is significantly higher. And then along the way, you have to have a mentality of um, moving fast, speed over perfection. Uh, and in that process, you will make mistakes. And that's okay as long as the, the size of your mistakes is very, very small. And a lot of people will try to avoid making mistakes because people are so worried about what will people say. But mistakes will happen whether you like it or not. Yeah. And the best way to fail is to try to avoid making mistakes. And our approach has always been that mistakes will happen. And what you've got to do is just make sure that your wins are more than your losses. Okay. Yeah. And the quantum of your wins, the size of your wins is significantly bigger than the size of your losses. And to do that requires doing unconventional things. Mm. To win big, you have to be unconventional and be right. Because if you're doing the same thing as everybody else, you'll get the same results. To get bigger results, you've got to do things differently and be right. And so... Um, and, and I think the last, last thing that sums up all of this stuff is if you are driven by social signals, if you're driven by what people think of you, your life as an entrepreneur is going to become a hundred times more difficult. Because as an entrepreneur, you're trying to cause change. And when you're trying to cause change, you're going up against what exists today. Right. What people are very comfortable with. And so you have to really believe and your team has to really believe in what you're doing, the change that you're causing for that to come to life. And that's the only way you think about unconventional things that nobody thinks about. And your DNA of trying a lot of things and building superior judgment over time will actually give you that big bank success that you're looking for that will give you that um, you know, massive user base, fantastic business that you're chasing after. Um, and I would, I would summarize everything in, in, in those two or three points. Sure. Um, we have an interesting question from GN. Uh, can we give the audio to GN? I would rather he ask or she asks it uh, themselves. Can you please unmute? Yeah, go on. Yes. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So essentially, I was saying that uh, since uh, since the, you know, the whole rationale of uh, technology and we keep talking about it is that it kind of crisis the, 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 the success rate. You know, like what do you, what, how do you anticipate that uh, other software uh, developers, not necessarily from India, can uh, create products that can replace the Google Android or the iOS? We still kind of, uh, it's still kind of monopolized by these two players, right? So uh, the question, question really was that uh, when small entrepreneurs have an idea that's potentially revolutionary and they begin to invest in uh, building that technology. But, you know, two or three or four months down the line, after they get the POC, there is uh, other players who have, bigger players who have the ability to replicate uh, that idea and uh, 
offer it at a you know at zero price to uh, a similar market which kind of destroys uh, these small software developers how how do how do software developers mitigate this risk thanks yeah it's a great question and i have a simple answer to that which is you know you know don't build anything remotely similar to these big guys go go find go you know go find your own you got to go play your own game if you think they're a game, you know, it's their rules. They've mastered the rules. They will come at you with full force. Go create a brand new game. And, you know, I think there's a word for this. It's called like the sword and, and, and shield strategy. And the shield is your go-to-market strategy. Your go-to-market strategy is so different from the incumbent that they don't feel the need to come after you. Right? As a matter of fact, initially, they will dismiss you saying, what, what are these guys building? It's too small for us. And the sword is... You know, over time, and what you're building becomes bigger and bigger. You tend to accumulate skills in that new game over time. And by the time the incumbent wakes up, the asymmetry of skill that you have is so overwhelming that it doesn't matter. So you have to create your own game. Don't chase after things that the big guys are already building because that's their game. They'll do that better. And even if they don't do it better, they'll have many more resources working in the same thing that you have. Yeah. And in the big space world, you know, if you get some success, hundreds of people are going to come chase after your, your opportunity. And so you also have to just accept the fact that in the big space world, and I think any business, but most in the big space, big space world, you have to continuously innovate. Just, you have to be in that wheel 24 so. And, um, you know, we've seen this happen globally, even with you know, companies like us. You just have to be innovative all the time and building things that are fundamentally different from the market. And you know, with Highland, for example, it's case in point. We're building something that is so different, that's not seen by the world, that it's a game that we're gonna play ourselves and build our own game. And we gotta move fast, and we gotta build our own skills in that game as soon as possible, so that if this opportunity, when it becomes very big and people start looking at it, we're so good at that game that it doesn't matter. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, I think Karan Pahuja is next. Can we give the audio to Karan? Please unmute Karan before you ask. I, can you hear oh, me? Yes. So I just have a quick question. So you were talking about uh, combining uh, gaming and high clan. What, what do you have um, a roadmap in, in your head or you know, what are you planning to do with the gaming? Um, and you know, how do you put these two things together? And uh, in case if you have like one minute, I would just wanted to ask like Geo is doing with WhatsApp, you know, we can do payments on WhatsApp. Is Hike planning to do something like that? Well, you know, you'll see the, the manifestation of gaming inside of Hike land soon when we launch it. Um, I think we're working on something pretty neat. I think that the customer is going to love. And we're no longer, you know, like I said, our, our whole thesis is that messaging is done. You know, like that's the old way. That's the old use experience and it was, you know, hundreds of millions of people, billions of people still continue to use it, but that's not the future. You know, and messaging as a business is pretty poor. You know, WhatsApp doesn't make any money still. <laughs> and so um, we don't look at what uh, the competition is doing. We don't look at what the old space is doing. We just focus on what our customers want we build for them. So I can't comment on what Facebook's gonna do with Geo and so on and so forth. I'm sure they have something planned. For our goal is can we build for our customers, can we make high plan into a magical product that people love? And also prove that we can build a fantastic business model around high plan. Sure. Uh, we'll take one final question from Prahlad Modi. Um, can we have Prahlad online? Please unmute Prahlad before you ask. Please unmute. Okay, so uh, Prahlad's question is that uh, Highland, uh, with all the virtual profiles and no concrete way to audit or verify the authenticity of the profiles, how, how do you tackle the problem of fake profiles? Uh, products like Tinder, etc., have invested a lot in that problem. Uh, so, you know, how do you guys put enough thought to this? Or, you know, so what, what I'm sure that there's a lot of uh, other areas, not just about the profiles, but hacking and cybersecurity, I'm sure these would all become areas of concern once the once you have a lot of users coming in. So how will you tackle it? Yeah, it's it's a product problem to be solved. And we're, we've gotten pretty good at you know, solving problems and we solve it. And as a matter of fact, it's something we're already working on. 
which is, uh, you know, with the hike emoji, there's the benefit of you can be who you want to be. On the other side, you can be anybody you want to be. <laughs> and so it's got a pro and a con. And so we're working towards making sure that um, uh, we're actually we're already working on a few things to solve this problem. And you'll see us announce this soon, but you'll see us get to a point where, um, you know, once you've chosen who you are, once you've chosen your name, once you've chosen your gender, age, you know, all that, all those sort of parameters, you will not be able to change all those things. And second of all, is when you take a photo of yourself to create the hike emoji, we can authenticate you if you're, you know, a guy or a girl. Um, and so there are many things that we're thinking about and that we're sort of working on to, to, to make sure that we solve for this. And uh, no doubt it's a, it's something we pay massive attention to because we want Hikeland to be a, not just a magical place for people to hang out, but a safe place too. Uh, and that's something that it's, uh, is at the very top of our list. Sure. Um, so I think uh, with that, we'll end the questions from the audience. You know, one thing before we conclude, uh, Kevin, you mentioned one thing that, you know, information today is something that is easily available. And I see a lot of books behind you. So what are, I've always known that unicorns, uh, you know, tend to read a lot of books and I always hear about Elon Musk and, you know, everybody in the Silicon Valley reading books all the time. So what books are you reading? What is it that you enjoy reading the most? And, you know, it's given you great insights. Wow, that's a loaded question, Ritu. <laughs> I, I read a lot and my, my interests are very, very diverse. Um, you know, I read um, stuff from, you know, all the, the boring business books, the uh, all the autobiographies you can sort of find your hands on to quantum physics, the, you know, and I've just been reading some of the Upanishads in the last year that are very intense and heavy books, but they're phenomenal. And I feel like it's, it's strange that we don't teach them to our kids in, in this country. Um, the one that I was reading recently that I just finished is uh, a book by Richard Feynman, The Pleasure of Finding Things Out. He's one of the, the best well-known sort of physicists of his time, still is. And he had a way of approaching problem solving and learning that um, I picked up that is just phenomenal, that lets you pick up new topics very, very fast. And so a lot of us to do about just, you know, how do you unlock, for me, a lot of my, and you know, just beyond the books, I spent a lot of time just asking how to unlock my own potential. Human beings are very capable species. And for some reason, we're not taught to unlock a lot of that potential at all. <laughs> through our education and, you know, kindergarten, middle school, high school, uh, college, we're just not taught. And I feel like uh, some of the best people in the world somehow either consciously or subconsciously figured out how to go do that. And um, so, you know, books like uh, um, the one that I talked about, Richard Feynman's book, it just shows you how, the way he thinks about stuff. Um, and there was a fantastic book that I read last year that I published also my top 10 books on, on my blog. Uh, was Atomic Habits. I think people on this forum would actually love that, which is about, you know, there's a, there's a saying, which is if there's a gap between your goals and habits, your habits always win. And so the habits that you develop in your daily life actually become who you are. Mm. And it's a very simple thought, but something that you would not think about because no one teaches you about being self-aware and understanding sort of who you are and, and what you do. And then there is, uh, like I said, deeper stuff. You know, I, I finished a bunch of Stephen Hawking, Hawking books last year. And I, my fascination for quantum physics and all things quantum and the Vedas and Upanishads actually have a common spine that I didn't realize. It's all, it all talks about one and the same thing. And, you know, I, I and this is going to sound maybe a bit sort of, you know, uh, at, at a different plane, but, um, I, I'm a very spiritual person and this journey started for me about eight, nine, ten years ago. And I spent a lot of time um, furthering that, I, I can't call it a mindset, I don't have the right word for it, but whatever that is. And uh, so I, I invest a lot of time, um, not just reading all that I can read, but also finding time for solitude, you know. Um, Every, every Sunday, I, I have at least two, three hours, if not four hours, where I just sit in silence. Um, and I think that's very, very important because um, we are so trained to take these searchlights, spotlights that we have and turn them outwards and go chasing for answers in the world. <laughs> but nobody turns those spotlights inwards. Yeah. And when you do, 
all the answers are sitting right there. And, and people, free, and this is not a, just a, a spiritual sort of, you know, mindset, but, you know, human beings, the, the building blocks of human beings is DNA. And, and DNA is cold storage for a lot of information that's stored millions of years. And so I feel like you have, I mean, human beings have the opportunity of unlocking that a little bit from time to time. And so that's why I spend time with myself because I feel like so many times that I'm looking for answers to a very complicated question, just sitting in that silence by doing nothing, answers will just drop in like these epiphanies that you have. And whether it's a, your, your mind is stimulating all the information that you read, or that's just uh, turning off your conscious mind and tapping into something deeper. And I feel like that's a practice that's worked really well for me. So I feel like finding time for solitude every day and more so you know, longer sort of periods of Sunday and also reading a lot of good material and putting good things in your mind, you know, um, that helps a lot. And you have only so much time in the day and it just takes 15, 20 minutes a day to do some of this stuff, not more. And I, have, I feel like it's a habit that uh, if many more developed, uh, the world would be in a very different place. Sure. And, you know, and such great things come out of that silence I've seen, you know, I glad I'm sure came out of that silence only. <laughs> well, thank you so much for talking to us, Kevin. I, it was a, it was an extremely insightful talk. And I feel that the ideas that you're bringing out today are probably going to be the ideas that uh, we will see uh, in all full force out there on the ground and people actually uh, mingling out there on social hangout places that you're creating today at uh, iClan. And we obviously um, are very keen to explore the platform and enjoy the various, uh, you know, uh, arenas that you've created for all of us out there. So thank you for joining us today. And to all the attendees, please uh, keep on posting the questions. Don't stop them from coming. Um, Kevin, if some, somebody in your team could actually answer, we've got a lot of questions on Facebook Live. If somebody could take a while to just answer some of the questions out there um, and uh, sort of talk to our attendees from time to time in the next few days, that would be very helpful. Absolutely, we'll do that. And thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to catch up with you. And thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks. And hope you enjoyed the talk. Thanks. Likewise.